Okay, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's a, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, session so far. So I'm going to be talking about what we do in terms of our real time response in terms of ice cube. So a lot of the historical physics results from ice cube, I'm going to gloss over very quickly and get to the meat and potatoes of, of you know, the multi mesh of the real time response. Um, so, you know, we tend to put this slide up when we talk about ice cube. Uh, we are looking for neutrinos from distant sources that tend to be generated in the interaction of cosmic rays near the source with either protons or gamma rays. This is, you know, kind of that, that picture we've been showing for the last decade where we expect strong correlation with gamma rays. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a lot of, of you know, distance effects that affect gamma rays that other messengers may not have. So, you know, this kind of broadening of the scope of, of our coordination, I think, is a very healthy thing for us in terms of trying to identify the sources of the neutrinos we're seeing. Um, but, you know, I, neutrinos are interesting messengers. They're neutral. They freely propagate. They're not impacted by magnetic fields. They can come from very distant sources. Uh, all of those things make them key things to be looking for, for, you know, as astrophysical messengers. To do this, we've built Ice Cube. Uh, everyone's probably seen this before, but in case you haven't, we've we've instrumented a cubic kilometer of glacial ice underneath the South Pole. Uh, being at the South Pole makes astronomy really, really easy for us. Every source just kind of rotates around us. We don't have to worry about transits and all of that thing. A source is either above the horizon or below the horizon that gives very different backgrounds. Uh, we instrument this with over 5,000 of these digital optical modules. They're a PMT with electronics on board that do the digitization of the signal. Communicate the results up to this little tiny building on the top, which is actually a two-story building. Um, and we generate events and, and do reconstructions and send alerts from this little building. Um, we've been operating since uh, you know, roughly 14 years of, of full detector operations with six or seven years of construction in between before that. Over 98% of our DOMs are healthy, taking good data 15 years later. So it's, it's really been an engineering feat to build this detector and keep it running as smoothly as it has for the last 15 years. Okay, so today I want to, you know, since we initially came out, you know, several, almost a decade ago now with the evidence that we're seeing this diffuse signal of astrophysical neutrinos, we've really tried to get into this game of, of being an active participant in this multi-messenger astrophysics game and trying to really get a handle on what the potential sources are. And there's been a few cases where this has really paid off. I think everyone in here, we've heard a couple of times about the TXS alert where we send a, a well-localized neutrino to a point in the sky right on top of a flaring Fermi source, <clears throat> led to a large multi-wavelength follow-up campaign and papers written about, you know, for the, for the last decade. Um, we, so we have two ways we, we engage the community. We notify you guys when we see uh, an interesting astrophysical neutrino. And then we have a collection of, of neutrino sample that we're collecting all the time. They may not all be astrophysical neutrino, but they allow us to do a real-time search for interesting accesses when, other in, when you guys send us alerts. So my talk today will really focus on the real-time alerts. And we've got several improvements we've been working on over the last few years that are coming online very soon. And we're also kind of looking for suggestions and feedback from you guys, how we can improve what we do with our alerts. Is there something you'd like to see from us? So that's a point we can discuss over the next couple of days. So what are we talking about when we talk about the neutrino sky? Well, first of all, from, the, from all everywhere in the sky, we see this diffuse signal of, of astrophysical neutrinos. That's this falling spectrum on an E to the minus two plot. So it's like E to the minus 2.3 or 2.4, uh, but it's well matched with the, the, the unresolved Fermi uh, gamma ray sources and the highest energy comes rate in terms of energy density. So there's, you know, this is strong, pretty good evidence that there's probably a strong link between these different populations. It's just trying to understand the details that we're, we're really struggling with. Whoop, backwards. Uh, in terms of sources, we've had a few. So there was the TXS observation where we see a, a in, in, in addition to the event, we see an excess of events. When we look backwards in time, we see a, a you know, 13 or 14 events at, at, in a short period of time. Uh, we're able to uh, identify that at, at roughly the three and a half sigma level. Uh, in terms of a steady source, over the last 15 years, we built up this 4.2 sigma excess at the location of NGC 1068. 
And then recently we've had this diffuse signal from the galactic plane using these new shower event reconstructions that we've been talking about. So this is uh, something we've been seeing, but it doesn't have the detail to be able to resolve individual sources or if this is truly just diffuse interaction in, in, with matter in the, in the uh, galactic plane. So these are open questions. The advent of CAM3Net will certainly help shed light on some of these things as well. Okay, so as you probably heard, these type of detectors are sensitive to all types of neutrinos. For a lot of the astronomy, we tend to focus on the, the charge current muon neutrino interactions because the interaction can, A can happen anywhere in or near the detector. So you, and you get these long muon tracks that go through your instrumented volume and give you pretty good pointing, poorer energy resolution. The other ones are these, these contained events, these showers where an electron neutrino or a or a uh, neutral current interaction happens, and you get this shower of light where all the, all the particle light interaction happens within a few meters, and the light then propagates out, and you see these largely. And there is a slight bit of asymmetry in the light uh, produced in this shower, and it allows you to do kind of 10 or 15 degrees direction resolution, but very good energy resolution since you're seeing all of the uh, light being de deposited. And of course, then we hope to see these, these pretty double bang events. After 15 years of observation, I can point to zero yeah. events that look like this. So this, you need to be above a PEV and see this, you know, to really see this clear double bang. We do have evidence of nearly overlapping uh, showers in, in with some machine learning algorithms, but that's, a, that's another talk. Okay, so what are we doing in terms of our real-time program? Uh, we have a very active one. The, the, I think the main workhorse one that people talk, know about are these single events where when we see an interesting astrophysical neutrino, we send you an alert and say, hey, look over here. Uh, it started with these, these two individual sources back in, in 2016, and then we merged it into a second version where we have additional tracks. Uh, and we have these two classifications called gold and bronze. And in 2020, we added these shower uh, alerts as well, where we send you a, 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 a wider area on the sky of where these these high energy neutrino events, uh, shower events can be coming from. Uh, we also have several dedicated reactions to external triggers. We've been following every gravitational wave event that, that, that's happened, looking for neutrinos in real time and reporting that uh, back through GCN. And we have these fast response analysis where we can trigger this internally. When somebody reports to us something interesting, we can then say, okay, let's take a look at our neutrino data in this two week period and, and see what's happening. Uh, Additionally, we've had these longstanding uh, agreements with partner institutions where we do these searches looking for sources from known gamma ray components, where we send an alert to our, our friends in the air sharing up telescopes. Uh, we have a program where we're looking for doublets that we were sending to optical telescopes in SWIFT several years ago that's kind of wound down since uh, the people stopped following them. <laughs> uh, but, but all this is done in the open, at least for the public alerts through, through things like GCN and SNOOS. Uh, snooze, we, we have, uh, just like uh, CAM3Net, we look at the noise rate on all of our PMTs, and a galactic supernova is going to raise that rate significantly, and we have good sensitivity in terms of the arrival time of the supernova, not so much on the directions, so we can't resolve the individual MEV events. Okay. Uh, one more important thing is we have a, an internal group within our collaboration that really helps organize our effort and our response, and these people are, you know, on call 24 seven, basically trying to make sure that our response is timely and accurate, right? So this has been a critical ingredient in trying to go to the whole collaboration of the publication board to write a GCN. This group is, a, is enabled to quickly approve and move those things out. Okay, so our single event neutrinos, what we're looking for here is events that are interesting above the background. So here I'm focusing right now on the, you know, this idea here is, is here with the tracks, we identify well-reconstructed track candidates. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the only thing that can make it through the Earth are neutrinos. In the Southern Hemisphere, we have this uh, rain of muons from cosmic ray showers that come down on us. But both of these components are generated by cosmic rays inter interacting with the atmosphere. They're not real neutrinos. Even though these are neutrinos, they're not astrophysical neutrinos. So this gives some ambiguity to what we're seeing. We look for the, the highest energy ones in that region and near the horizon. And in the northern hemisphere, in the southern in the southern sky, it really has to be higher energy for tracks. So they're they're much rarer. So most of the track alert events are near or just, just below the horizon. Um, but we can get them, identify them at the South Pole, uh, 
get the alerts to the north and on the alert systems within about a minute, which if you've ever worked on a computer at the South Pole, you'll be very impressed. Uh, Ice Cube's running pretty much all the time. It has very little downtime. Our uptime is north of 99% with good quality data being produced all the time. Uh, and let's see, so yes, the track alerts we send, uh, in terms of these, we have two criteria, the gold and the bronze selections. The gold alerts are 50% on average likely to be astrophysical neutrinos. That means at that threshold, this 50-50 chance of being an astrophysical neutrino or an atmospheric neutrino, they can go higher as the energy goes up. Uh, the bronze alerts are to get an additional sample, but these are you know, dominated at some more than half by, by atmospheric background. Uh, but we expect roughly 12 of the gold events per year and an additional 18 in the bronze. <coughs> this is what a typical one might look like. You see it going through a, a large part of the instrumented volume. We're able then to initially online send you a, an error a, an error circle quick from our quick reconstruction online. And then we do a detailed follow-up reconstruction and, and generate these error contours. And you can see they're, they're really dominated around the horizon. I'm running out of time, so I better speed up. Um, additionally, we have... We have uh, real-time point source searches where we're able to, you know, instead of just focusing on the highest energy events and tracks that, that, that could generate these alerts, we're able to use, if there is this component of, of astrophysical neutrinos buried in the background, we're able to statistically do statistical tests and see if there's an excess at that point in the sky above the random background of atmospheric neutrinos. And we use this to respond to Ex external alerts like gravitational waves, reported flare in the AGNs on GCNs and ATELs, and then our own alerts. We do a follow up to look for additional neutrinos from the direction of the alert. I'm going to speed up since we're running out of time. We have several improvements that are coming down the pipe, uh, both for uh, the single neutrino events. We have a new factory uh, reconstruction toolbox that generates the these contours that we were that we distribute much more quickly. So we're able to get these results much more quickly. Uh, and as well as several improvements in the follow-up reconstruction. We've known for a problem, this has been a problem and it's a difficult problem to be able to do this very well with our with the complicated ice model. But we have several improvements in the ice modeling in the, uh, the likelihood models that, that are used. And just to give you a flavor of what we're talking about here, this, these are you know angular error distributions for cascades, uh, in two different energy ranges, and you can see really almost factors of two improvements. So this is something we're, we're coming. It's going to not quite be as a big of an effect for tracks, but it's it's definitely an improvement. Um, and we have uh, we're working to update our our this this uh, catalog based search that we've been running online and sharing with partners and sharing that with with uh, everyone publicly, and then moving to a new alert platform. So one of the things I wanted to quickly touch on is you know things we should be discussing. I'm happy to discuss this week. Um, how can we best make our update, you know, our alert messages more useful for everyone out there in the community? Right? We're in considering including, you know, LIGO-like sky maps along with these alerts. Is that something people are going to find useful? Um, how best to communicate with you guys when we make changes? Right? It's not clear. We we we've, we've been putting out documents that are in the old GCN classic system. And with the newer systems, we've been using the GCN web page uh, on, on the mission plan. But what's the best way to make sure everyone's clear on what's going on? Should we be using multiple alert systems, GCN and SIMA and other things, or just focus on one? And how do we raise the profile of our shower alerts? These are much more astrophysically pure. They're poorly, not as well localized, but they're similar localizations to many LIGO events. These are generally 90% pure astrophysical signals. And how do we highlight to everyone? This one's really different than the ones. There, there, there's going to be the one every couple of years that's very high energy and very interesting. How do we highlight that to you? It's just saying it's got a high signal, let's go for it. So let's discuss and, and we can find ways to do this. I have a couple slides on planned upgrades. I'll go through these, leave these for discussion if people are interested in what's going on. We've got seven new strings going in the deepest part of the detector in the next couple, in, next year. And then we also have a, a plan for a, a much larger detector that has a technical design. Report. But I'll stop here.